Good morning, Living Water. Great having you all here. I got to stand back here. I feel short down there. <laughs> um, good to have you, and welcome to everyone who's here in the sanctuary, and welcome live streamers. We're glad to have you. A couple of announcements this morning before we get started with our worship. Um, the ladies' group did not meet this past Saturday, and they're not going to meet this Saturday at least at 7 a.m. Okay, mm -hmm. so. We are going to meet here, ladies, at 10.30 here at the church on Saturday. We're going to have a little luncheon, and we're going to pack care bags for uh, homeless and others that might need a care bag. We had one left, I think, back there for uh, someone who might want to take it with them this week and hand it out on the corner when you're driving. But uh, we're going to put some more bags together, and we're going to have a, a time of fellowship. So ladies, come and join us, 10.30. Saturday morning on the 12th. Sunday morning on the 13th, we have a leadership meeting. So if you're involved with the leaders, stay afterwards and we will feed you lunch and you'll have a leadership meeting. And let me see, got lots of little dates here. Um, by the way, the men's group is still meeting every Sunday morning, having a great time, 9.30 to about 10, 10 sometimes 10 after, and enjoying a, a time of devotion. So you're welcome to join that group. That's every Sunday morning. And um, let me see, uh, tithes and offerings. If the Lord leads you to give a uh, tithe or offering, we have a box in the back underneath the clock if you're here in the sanctuary, or you can give online at our website, www.pwlivingwater.org. And then um, ne next, June 20th. Okay, so that's a couple weeks, but that's Father's Day, okay? On Father's Day, uh, at 8.45, the men, all the men in the church, are going to meet over at Dew Drop, not just like right across the street from us, pretty much, and have breakfast. So come and join the men at 8.45, and um, the praise team will figure out what we're going to do uh, as far as practice or anything, because I'm sure everybody's going to want to eat, right? Okay. So 8.45, breakfast over at Dew Drop on June 20th on Father's Day. And then July 4th, we're going, since it is a Sunday, we're going to have a barbecue here. And um, we're still working out the details of blocking off a couple of parking spots to have a grill out there and a tent. And we can give hamburgers and hot dogs to people driving by. And we can also have some food in here for everybody to enjoy after service. So it's going to be a barbecue theme, and we're just going to have a great time barbecuing and sharing our our faith and our love and our food with passerbys if we want to, okay? Um, so that's on July 4th. And then July 24th, um, we have a ladies' high tea and luncheon. This is for the ladies' group, and we're going to have a little luncheon here, and um, I was going to say, the, I guess the guest speaker is me. <laughs> so I have a message to give on being strong and courageous, so come and hear the message, but come and have high tea and a luncheon. And that's on July 24th. It's on a Saturday. And I haven't put down the time yet because it's still a little bit of ways, but keep it marked on your calendar to join us for that. And I think that's all of the announcements today. So um, Mike is out of town today, so we wish him a safe travels. He's in Kentucky, so our bass player is not here. And so Jim and I and Bobby are going to lead worship this morning. Self living water unplugged, I guess. <laughs> if you'd like to join us in worship, you can stand. God is good, though. Absolutely. All yes, the time. He is. All the time, God is good. Is good, good movie, time. too. Yeah. adjusted there. Got to wait on the drummer sometimes. <laughs> one, two, one, two, He's ready. three, Creation, bow 
come shall never pass away. No matter what we're going through right now, no matter what happens tomorrow, next year, um, the Lord is always with us. His kingdom will never pass away. I love this song. It's a little older one. Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. If we would just do that, Lord, ima or people imagine what the Lord can do, right? Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord. 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 And he, and he shall lift you up higher and higher. And he, and he shall lift you up. Humble thyself. Side of the Lord. one of the first songs that Jim and I sang together actually. He wrote this a while back. And um, it's just to remember that he's always there with us.
Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to bow before you this morning. We want to lay everything else aside, everything that happened this past week, everything that we're going to be facing this next week. Lord, and just bow before you. You are our King, Lord Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you. Thank you that we can come before you any time, Lord Jesus. Thank you that we live in a country that we can still do that, even though it's getting harder. But we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to come to you in worship today with other believers. We ask that you bless this service this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Pastor Ron. I hope you had a good week. I sure did. Um, there's a Bible verse I want to read, and it's Psalm 37, 24. Though a man falls, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord holds him with his hand. Now, I'm going to show you a trick this morning, and then I'm going to let you try it. And uh, what we're going to do is uh, balance a quarter on our arm, and the quarter will suddenly fall, and then you know, after a few tries, you can catch it with your hand. So let me, sh let me show you. Okay. Here's the ball. Quarter left, half left. Oop, I missed. So if you miss, you miss. All right. After a few tries, hold it like that. You want to try it? Okay. Try one, and uh, put it, just stretch your arm out like this, palm up. Quarter right here in your in the hand, and then lower your arm. Okay, quarter. Okay. <laughs> Get try it again there. Let's see if you can now you put the quarter further back or, uh, towards your elbow. About right there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's sticking to your arm. You must. <laughs> One more time. We'll try it again. See? Look. Now then, I've got a mole. But anyway, the reason that I show that this morning is it kind of illustrates that sometimes, here you can have one, add the quarter. Uh, we get into, into a lot of trouble. We feel like we're falling, just like that quarter fell off of our arm. And But our hand, if we can train it, we can catch that quarter and, then, uh, and hold it. Well, you know, God, what that uh, psalm says, that though a man fall, he shall not be utterly cast down. Why? For the Lord holds him with his hand. So even though we're going through some very, very tough times in our life, um, we can trust God to catch us and to hold us in the palm of his hand. And we're not going to fall down. We're not going to splatter all over the place. But God is going to take care of us. Uh, because of uh, the Lord upholds us in his hand, we don't have to worry. No matter what our scary problems are, how much we feel like we're falling, uh, God's swift enough to, and strong enough to catch us, unlike us when we, we fumble the quarter. Um, so let's pray. Father, thank you for protecting us in all of our circumstances. Thank you for letting us suffer our consequences of our actions so that we can grow stronger and stronger in you. Thank you for ultimately keeping us safe in your strong hand. Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Um, kids, um, Miss Kathy has agreed to go back in the Sunday school. She has some music for you. Um, if you want to go back with, with uh, Miss Kathy, you're welcome to do that. How about now? Yeah. Um, it's good to see everybody here this morning. Um, what we're going to do first is we're going to read the Word of God. John and I are going to 
split this up. There are 19 verses uh, on this uh, 11th chapter of Revelation. And I'm going to start reading. So if you'll stand with me, please. Okay, here we go. A new King James Version. So, then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God, the altar, and those who worship there. But leave out the court which is outside the temple, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles. And they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months. Three says, And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth and devours their enemies. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. Verse 6 says this, These have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of the prophecy. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. Verse 7, when they finish their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. Number 8, and their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Then those this is nine, from the people's tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put in graves. John. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell among them which saw them. And they heard the great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither, and they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were affrighted and given glory unto the and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and shall reign for ever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art thou waste and art come, because thou hast taken to thee great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and the wrath has come, and the time of the dead, and that they should be judged, and that they should give reward unto they should give reward unto the servants and prophets, and to the saints and to them they them they blah excuse me. Them that, they f them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightings and vo lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Thank you, John. Um, where's he at? Brother... Uh Charlie, there you are. Jump up and down. <laughs> he sat in a different spot. He did. I was looking for him. Just say a prayer for us. Here, I think use I'm mine. Yeah. yeah, because everyone wants to hear my voice. Yes, we do. <laughs> okay, uh, let's pray. We thank you, dear Lord, that... Uh, that you welcome us here to your house of worship that we may be able to come and freely worship you. We thank you for that. We ask that you uh, be with our pastor Jim here and that you give him your words to speak and that we may leave here changed people. In your name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Charlie. Good. All 
righty then. Let's get into this and see what God wants to talk to us about, wants to tell us. This is an interesting chapter, church. Um, talked about the uh, two witnesses. Their message is supernatural, powerful. It deals with death and resurrection. And it's interesting at this moment, uh, the story, uh, how it goes at this part, part. Their influence precedes the end of the trumpet's judge, judgments and sets the stage for the final series, the seven bold judgments. We're gonna get into them later. Um, this is actually the second thing that's going on. Now, John is given a measuring device. Did a lot of that this week. In fact, no matter we use the tape, our, our puppy, I'm saying our puppy, sometimes it's just Sue's puppy. Um, he's been digging up my, my, uh, um, my drains and uh, he digged them up and so we had to fix them so he could dig, dig them up. But we had to measure stuff out. But we love him, I think, do we? Yeah, I guess so. Anyway. John is given this measuring device and told to measure the temple, the altar, and the worshipers. I thought this was interesting. Measuring it in this time, in this period, was symbolic of ownership. Okay? Only those that had rights to something such as land or building or people were allowed to measure them. As part of this task, John is told, listen to me, the outer part of the temple is not to be measured. Don't measure it. Okay, this is an area occupied by the nation, which is for the Gentiles. A part of trampling experienced by Jerusalem in the end times. So God said, measure this, but don't measure that. These are going to be for these guys right here. Okay, and then what does God do? He introduces two unidentified witnesses. I don't know who they are. The Bible doesn't say. Some people say, well, maybe it was Elijah. You know, maybe it was Moses. We don't know. But he has these two witnesses who stand in Jerusalem and proclaim God's glory. Okay, only two. And they're praising God. Obviously, at this time, the message will not be well received, and it wasn't. It wasn't. But it's interesting, these guys are supernaturally protected. Everyone who tried to hurt them would be destroyed by fire out of their mouths. Uh, these men also bring various plagues on the earth, such as drought and famine. Finally, mm, these two men will be murdered. They'd be murdered by the beast that rises from the bottomless pit. Most people believe it's the same beast that's in Revelation 13, also referred to as the Antichrist. To the unbelieving world, boy, they start doing the dance of joy. Oh, got rid of these guys. We killed them. We don't have to listen to them anymore. It'll be like a major victory. Their leader will have defeated Satan, the Antichrist, by defeating these two guys who are speaking and claiming the gospel, and we're speaking for God. The world will be overjoyed. Triumph. They will celebrate and exchange gifts while they leave these bodies to lie in the street to rot. Get this, though, and I thought a lot about this. Thanks to modern technology at this time, people will be on their cell phones checking this out. They'll be on their tablets and the computers watching this all over the world. These guys being killed by this beast. About three and a half days later, guess what? The joy comes to an end. The world will turn in shock and horror. God will resurrect these two guys in full view of the world. So the same people that saw them being killed will see them rise up. It's interesting. Announced by a voice and carried by a cloud, they will be taken into heaven. Can you imagine watching that on your cell phone? Whoa! Or even seeing it. At the same time, a massive earthquake will strike Jerusalem, destroying a tenth of the city 
killing 7,000 people. It's a lot of folks. Those that survive will not honor God still. After all this, will not honor God. They will be fearful, and their reactions will be fearful, but they still won't honor God. You wonder sometimes, what will it take? What will it take for us to honor God? Hope we didn't get to this point. I'm talking about right now, where we sit. What will it take for us to honor God, church? Truly honor God. I think there has to be a change here so there can be a change here. Earlier, those reading Revelation were warned about certain woes yet to come. The first and second woes, those were the fifth and sixth trumpet judgments respectively. Those were far worse than the terrible trumpet judgments that came before. So you have these different things happening and are still the third one, the bowl judgments, where the angel pours a bowl of something out on the earth. We'll get to that. Not in this chapter, though. The third roll will be inaugurated with the seventh trumpet. Just as the seventh trumpet will contain individual events, like I said, known as the judgment bowls. Now, in the meantime, as the seventh trumpet sounds, heaven praises God for his righteousness judgment on evil. I'm going to, well, hang on, let me finish. This raises two important questions. And I wanted to tie this into the lesson because I've had a lot of people come up to me lately, church, and ask me certain questions. One is, Brother Jim, or Pastor Jim, did God create evil? I'm hearing this a lot nowadays. Did God create evil? Two, if he did not create evil, why does he have the right to judge evil? I was in a conversation the other day with someone. Did God create evil? And if God is an all-loving and powerful, then why do we have evil in the universe? Why do we have evil in the universe? Why is all this stuff going on? I don't get it. It makes no sense to me. I don't want to believe in a God, your God, that you believe in, because all of this stuff is going on. The other possibility is this, church, that God is a God, a good God, but, not, but does not have the ability to do anything about evil. That's a possibility. That would mean that God is good, but not all-powerful. So as we were talking about these things, I got to really praying and think, how can I talk to the church? And how can I talk to this person who is asking me all these questions, who is really struggling? Here's the third possibility, though. I believe God is neither bad, nor is he limited in his power. That's what I believe. God is not bad, and he is not limited in any kind of power. It is true that if God created evil, hear me, it would make him a bad God. So if he's good, he didn't do it. But this is not the case. Evil came as a result of what, church? Sin. And sin is something that God did not want in the universe. He didn't want it. People are struggling with this. And it was not just the person I was talking to the other day. A lot of people feel this way. You want me to believe in something that I can't see, that I really don't know that's there, and I look around and I see evidence of evil. It's very physical. It's what we see first. We don't see the good necessarily first. We see the evil all around us. Now listen to me. Unlike many religions, Christianity recognizes that evil does exist. We have to recognize that. I'm going to tell you something. We cannot have evil without good. 
The Bible in both Testaments acknowledges this is that the world is an evil, it is in an evil state. Bobby was saying that this morning. Pretty heartfelt what he said. He said, it's just a mess. And it is. And I gotta tell you, it's going to get worse. No, Pastor Jim, yeah. It's going to get worse. But listen to me, please. The origin of evil does not lie with God, but with who? Humanity. I'm trying to explain this to this person. Humanity. In Genesis 1, what happened? What did Eve do? What did Adam do? They were what? They disobeyed. They disobeyed. Yes. God didn't want them to. People say, well, if he's all-knowing, this is what I heard, if he's all-knowing, how come... He, didn't he know they were going to sin? I said, yes. He did know they were going to sin. Well, that doesn't make sense. It does. Because God created us. Hear me, please. He gave us a choice to obey or disobey. We cannot sit around in our churches, in our homes, in our jobs, wherever we are, and blame God for what's going on. He did not want this. He didn't want any of this. We forced this. Now listen to me. When Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, they brought evil into the universe. Bottom line. This is very interesting. I want you to get this. Evil is an action or a relationship. It is not a created substance. It's not. It's an, it's an action. I'm going to take that apple off that tree because it looks good. The action was I'm taking the apple and taking a bite. The consequence was you're going to die and you sinned against me. That was a consequence. And it's carried on to all of us. We all take that. Evil, get this, please. Evil is the absence of good. Check it out. Like light is the absence of dark. If you walk into a dark room, feeling around, and you flip on the light switch, what happens? It's flooded with light. You turn it off, it's dark again. Light is the absence of dark. Evil is the absence of good. Here's another one. Heat is the absence of cold. What happens when you're cold? My wife wraps up like a polar bear, but, and she'll turn the heat up. It's cold. Got to get warm. There's an interesting passage of Scripture that seems to teach, I want you to listen to this, that God created evil. And I, I searched and searched, was looking for stuff. This is in the King James Version of the Bible. It's Isaiah 45, 7. Look at it. It reads the following. I form the light and create it, create darkness. Get this. I make peace and create it evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Uh-oh. Somebody said, see? Just the other day, see, I told you. This passage has created confusion. However, this is not what the original Hebrew says. The word translated evil is the word ra. It also means sorrow, calamity, disaster, afflictions, and adversity, church. Modern translations have correctly translated this passage with a different English word, such as this example. I form the light, hear me, and the create darkness. I bring pos poster prosperity and create disaster. Prosperity, yeah. I, the Lord, do all these things. Therefore, the scripture, scriptures do not teach that God made evil. Church, God did not create evil, but he allowed it to exist so that we can know the difference between good and evil and have a choice to be obedient or not. Bottom line, I am tired of hearing God did this. 
But the devil made me do this. Okay. But I am tired of hearing that God is the author of all this chaos that we're living under. Wrong answer. Completely wrong answer. It is us. Our choice. God is a holy God and is incapable, church, of evil. It's incapable. He can't do it. He didn't create it, and he's not to blame for the evil in the universe. Evil in the world is due to the direct choice of humans in the world. I can't stress that enough. Murder, stealing, lying cannot be blamed on God. Don't do it. People choose to do these things and must be held accountable. Natural disasters are a result of a fallen world. This is the other thing that came up. Well, why COVID? Why do a bunch of people get killed in a tsunami or earthquake? Or why does all these things happen? Natural disasters are a result of a fallen world. Earthquakes and famine, famines, floods, volcanoes are not caused by humans directly. I'm not saying that. But we are indirectly responsible for their occurrences. They occur as a result of our sin. When sin entered the universe, get this, everything was affected. Everything. Everything that God made was affected. God's perfect world is now tainted by sin. The Bible says that the entire creation is now suffering. You know when God destroyed the world by flood, he was watching all this going on, all this evil. What did he say, church? I'm sorry I made this. What he said? I'm sorry I made, created this. I'll destroy it and start over again. That was his right. We'll try again. He also promised us that he would never destroy the world by flood again. His rainbow is a proof of that. That was his covenant to us. But he said, I am sorry that I made it. Even animals, everything he saw, everything is evil. The big second question to me was, if God did not create evil, why does he have the right to judge evil? I prayed right away. When you're talking sometimes to people, you got to get it right, but you got to pray and ask God to give you discernment and wisdom because Satan is so slick and he uses words and things that kind of trip you up. God doesn't want his people to be unprepared. He will give you the answers. If he doesn't, you can always say, I'm going to look that up in his word. The first thing that comes to mind is God is our creator. If you make something, don't you have the right to control it? Tell it what to do? Listen to me. To qualify as a judge, the first thing a person needs is what? Authority. Authority. Supreme Court justices derive their authority from what, guys? The Constitution. Okay? Which they promise to uphold. I think most of them do that. But listen to me, God's authority is not based on some piece of paper. It's not. But on much more authoritative grounds. He's his position as our maker. He owns us. What? People don't want to hear that. He owns us. And as an owner, he has the right to judge us according to his standards. Not ours. His standards. He owns us. He made us. You can argue with me that evolution, all these other things, but more evidence nowadays points that there was a supreme being, God, that created this world. We can get in all that. This person said to me, you know, okay, I believe that there's a, there a supreme being, but I think there was a bunch of gods that helped him. God didn't need any help. The Bible says this, he was there in the beginning, floating over the face of the deep. He was there. 
Well, I don't get that. Why, we, why was he just there? Because he was. Well, I don't know what else you want me to tell you, dude. He was there. The Bible says he was there. Well, I don't I said, how can you explain, can you explain to me how the human eye works? How is that made? And how are we able to see through our eyeballs? You look at the human hand. They can make something that looks like a claw that works fairly good, but it's not like the one God gave you. Our joints, a big one is our heart. We can get the pump five or the sixth or tenth, I don't know which one they made now, but it's not like the one God gave us. Who did that? People, well, who, it's that old saying, well, what, who crossed the road first? Or who was here first, the chicken or the egg? Well, who made the egg? God. God. God's authority is not based on a human piece of paper. The earth, guess what, church, is the Lord's. It's his and all it contains because he made everything. The ground which we walk on. We take these things for granted. The food which we eat. The air that we breathe. Now that's a good one. How do our lungs work? Think about that. We don't know really. I've studied a little bit about it in school. But man, that is an amazing piece of engineering inside of us. Our lungs. Our circulatory system and all that. Who made that? Some man? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. By a heavenly God. Even our bodies belong to him. Why? Because he gave us life. Uh-oh. That's a tough one for scientists to get around. And we still walk around every day and breathe. Our heart beats, our muscles work, and you know what? We don't even think about it. I was out, and I thought about this morning. My wife and I were out in the yard working. Uh, I was fine working, but this morning I thought about a little sore. My point is, we take our bodies, how we see and hear, for granted. There's weird things in our ears, like anvils and, and how the ear works and all this, and there's a tympanic membrane and all. Who can't come up with all that stuff? And it works. We abuse our bodies over the years. We don't take care of them very well. But God knit us together. And guess what? He knew who we were going to be before we were even born. How about that one? I knew you. Before you were even born, I knew you. He made us and gave us life. Guess what? For that reason, we are accountable to him. Just for that reason alone. There are a lot of other reasons. Well, I don't believe it. You know what I have to say to that? Forgive me, but too bad. Too bad. That's the way it is. That's the way it is, church. We were made by an awesome creator of heaven and earth. He blew his breath of life in us, and we got up. You know, I know all of you have seen a tiny baby come into the world, or at least held one, maybe. That is incredible. It looks like mom and dad, or Uncle Joe down the road. That is an incredible miracle. We can't do that without a holy God. Can't happen. You know, apologetics is not apologizing for loving a holy father. It's telling people this is truth. This is truth. We're not apologizing for what we believe, church. We're telling people what we believe. 
No. Psalms 102, and I love this one. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who made us, not we ourselves. We are the sheep of his pasture. Simple. God made us. He created us. He is a perfect God and complete and not dependent on anyone. You know, the thing is, he did not have to create us. Didn't need to. But he did. And his life and happiness is not dependent on us. There is nothing that we can bribe him with. Nor do we have to worry about him favoring someone else. Because they have power and position or popularity or intelligence. All that stuff comes from God. There's nothing we can give God that he didn't give us first. I love that. Oh, I'm going to give this to God. I'm going to do this for God. God said, what you do, do in quiet. Pray to me in quiet. He doesn't need our stuff. He gave us our stuff. God has the right To judge us, bottom line, because he made us. I'm going to say this in summary, church. There are important things to remember about Revelation 11. It involved two powerful witnesses God raised up in the middle of the tribulation. These two witnesses ministered through in the second half of the tribulation. They were martyred. God brought them back to life. But I want you to know the important thing here is we serve an awesome God. Please don't forget that. Don't forget that. We should be down on our knees. We should be broken. We should understand it is not about us. I get so tired of people, Christians especially, talking about their problems and their issues and this and that, and they don't for some reason don't know the word and they don't know that God is first and should be first. That's the problem. When I go there, that's a problem with me. I think I can do it on my own at times. I think I can, oh well, I got this. We have to realize That when we go to God, church, and he wants us to come to us, leave everything there. Don't leave some of it and drag the rest back with you. You're not trusting him when you do that. I've been there. Leave it all at his feet, whatever you're going through. Trust him. Boy, if we could trust him... If we could truly trust him, and I ask is, do we truly trust God? Do we really trust him to the point where, like a little kid, we're willing to say, whatever, Lord, instead of hanging on to our stuff, if I don't, this might happen. I better watch this. And I'm learning that when I totally let go, man, it's amazing what he does. Totally let go. My heart, my mind, how I'm feeling, and tell him. I told this person the other day, let go. I'm not just saying words up here. I'm trying to tell you what I know is the truth. Let go. Let God fill you up. Let his spirit take over. Don't hold back. So you don't know him, I told this person. You don't know him because you haven't let go. Let him in your heart, totally. See what that feels like. Try that on for a minute. The important thing here is to understand that God wants everyone 
and is giving everyone a chance to repent. That's the key, too. Do you understand, church, when we repent and tell God that we're sorry, he starts all over with us. You may have sinned the day before, but when you repent and come to him like a new day with God, he's forgot about all that. And he slings those sins as far from the east as to the west. Don't hang on to that stuff. Don't let bitterness seep into your life. Take, you know, most sin starts with pride. I've been there. Pride. I can't, I just can't let it. I don't want, I don't, it's pride. We need to squash it. Squash that pride. Let God have it. Here. We need to take a shovel and clean it out. Clean it out inside. Fill it up with the Holy Spirit of God. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying we got to do it. We got to do it. You know, he, he's waiting. The best times that I have with my Lord and Savior is when I pray and I set and shut up and let him speak to me and let him fill me with what he wants me to know. That, those are the most precious times that I have with him. He doesn't need to listen to us all the time. He wants us to do what, church? Listen to him. Let him speak to our hearts. I get by myself. I'm just quiet. Let him talk to me. God wants none to perish. Do you believe he's going to give everybody a chance all the way to the end? And people will turn their back on him. We're doing it now. We need to quit worrying about stuff and worry about God. How can we please God? Our stuff and the things we do are not going to get us to hell. I don't care how good we think we are. It's not going to get us to hell. We talked about in the men's group indirectly. Faith. My faith is not very big. I don't know. Who cares? Give God what you got. And let God give you what he got. So he puts them two together and it's monstrous. It's monstrous. Well, I don't like this because this and the... Trust him. Do we really love God? I asked myself that yesterday after I got off the phone. Do we really love God? What am I doing that shows God that I really love him? You know what's funny? When I was sitting there praying, I didn't hear anything. Sometimes God will speak gently to him. I didn't hear anything. And I thought, uh-oh, uh oh, uh -oh. What am I doing that shows you that I love you, Father? I'm a preacher. <laughs> Thank you, God. And I'm not making light of that. What I'm trying to say to you, there's more, church. There's more. God wants more. He wants more from all of us. Dig deeper. Dig deeper. I don't understand God. He understands you very well. Have you talked to him? I don't know how to talk to him. Can you talk to me? Well, yeah. Talk to him the same way. Not hard. My prayer and I'm done today for all of you is to think about one do you love God truly love him number two if you do then is he the Lord of your life completely willing to risk it all even if you have to do something 
may not be popular. The world out there may say, oh, but you do it anyway. Because it's not about you. And number three, are you reading this? Or is it up on the shelf behind the trash compactors? Are you reading the word of God? I miss sometimes, I'm not gonna lie. Busyness, life. But what I'm saying to you, we can't know him until we read him. You know what I'm saying? We got to take time for him. He wants us to take time with him. This is how we do it right here in prayer. Father Jesus, thank you for what you've given me to speak about today. Thank you for these dear saints that have come out. I got a little frustrated, Lord, because the numbers have been down a little bit. I am not going to lie. But what I realize, Lord, that you are in control of all that. And what you really want is those that have come to have a relationship with you. Can't worry about all the little things that are happening. You got all that. We just need to come to you open hearts and open minds. Help us to read your word. Pray it. Not just speak it, but pray it. Help us, Father, to talk to our families about it. Talk to our children about it. Be excited about your word in church. Don't just go away from here and another Sunday. Let it be a way of life, Father that we can truly be transformed, truly walk in a Christ-like manner, to be different. We want others to see that we are different because you live inside of us, oh Lord. Change the way we think, the way we live. Help us, oh God, to be what you want us to be, not what we think we should be. It doesn't matter where we're at in our walk. You're right there with us if we call on you. Thank you, almighty God, for this message. Those that hear it, and these things we ask in your mighty name, amen. Amen. You know, I think about the, uh, the witnesses that we talked about in Revelation, and even then, God sent these witnesses to, to prophesy and to reach anybody that would listen, even then. And um, I, I just am, am awed at his patience with humanity. We're going to sing an older song. You can stand with us if you would like.
Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You are the rock of ages. We ask that you bless the rest of this day, Lord, and our week to follow. Help us to remember, Lord, that it's never too late to talk to somebody, never too late to witness to somebody. And Lord, remind us that all of this that we're reading in Revelation is, is uh, your plan for our salvation and for our victory in you, Lord Jesus. These things we pray. Amen. Dismissed.